Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your holy name, Father God. Glory to your holy name. Father God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Father God, for keeping us through this day and allowing us to come again, Father God, this evening to sup at your table, oh God. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for by your word you feed us and we thank you, oh God. Father God, we continue to pray as we go through the book of Isaiah and we read your word, oh God. We pray, Father God, to get um, understanding, understanding. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to reveal yourself to us, oh God. And Father God, allow us to see ourselves, oh God in your word, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We ask tonight, oh God, that you forgive us all sins, all iniquity, trespasses, and transgressions, oh God, that we may have committed against thee, oh God. We pray for clean hands and a pure heart, and we ask that you'd restore and renew in us a right, steadfast spirit, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. We pray, almighty Yahuwah, Father God, that you re remove all things that hinder us, that block us from getting understanding of your word, oh God. We pray, Father God, right now over the airways that surround us, oh God, we bind, rebuke, cast out, and bring to no effect all foul, unclean, hindering spirits, and we command them to leave our presence in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you, Father God, for tonight. We thank you for your word, Father God, for it is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet, oh God, and we thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, before I get started, I just want to let everyone know that the remaining of the questions from 36 to chapter 66 are now um, on the website, okay? So if you want to go ahead and download those and print them or download them to your computer, you're free at will, amen? All right. So last week, we finished up chapter 33. It was awesome, praise God. And that was uh, basically a, a message that concerned Assyria and um, God's judgment on Assyria. And tonight we're going to go into chapters 34. And tonight I'll be reading from the um, New Living Translation. I'll be also using the King James and the New King James. I mean, I'll probably go back and forth. Amen. But uh, we're going to start tonight, um, thir chapter 34, verse 1 in Isaiah. Amen. And it reads, come and hear and listen, O nations of the earth. Let the world and everything in it hear my words. For the Lord is enraged against the nations. His fury is against all their armies. He will completely destroy them, dooming them to slaughter. And I want to stop right here because this references back to Isaiah 26 that we read in chapter 26, verse 20. And I'm going to read that real quick. And it re I must, I think I did this last week, didn't I? I did the same thing. I wrote down that verse. And it. We too read the name, but nothing comes of our, okay, 18 and 19 of uh, Isaiah 26. And it says, we too read in agony, but nothing comes of our suffering. We've not given salvation to the earth nor brought life into the world. But those who die in the Lord will live and their bodies will rise again. And those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy for your life giving light will fall like dew of your people in the place of the dead. Amen. And we're going to go back and let's go to um, verse three. And it says, their dead will be left unburied and the stench of rotting bodies will fill the land. The mountains will flow with their blood. The heavens above will melt away and disappear like a rolled up scroll and the stars will fall from the sky like withered leaves from a grapevine of shriveled figs from a fig tree. <clears throat> now, stop right there. And I want to, um, as it references 34.4, let's, let's go back to, you can write them down, I'll read them. But we're going to go to Isaiah 13 and read verses 9 through 11, because that verse references this. 
or reflects back on this. So uh, Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. And it reads, For see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of his fury and fierce anger. The land will be made desolate and all sinners destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them and the stars will give no light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will provide no light. Amen. So that's all references back to the day of the Lord. Amen. So also this same verse, I want to read um, Joel 2, 18. Joel 2, Joel. I think it was Joel. Yeah, Joel. Joel. Let's see. Let's see Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. What was that Joel? Let's see. Joel 2, Matthew 24. 24. So, actually, Matthew 24, 29, and it reads... Matthew 24, 29. And it says, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. Amen. And then let's see, was, I had another one here. I think it was. I'm sorry, I have a new, this is a different Bible and it don't fall. <laughs> the pages stick together. They don't fall like my Bible I read all the time. But amen. Let's see. With, I think with 2 Peter. Yeah, 2 Peter. 2 Peter, verse 3. 2 Peter 3.10, yeah. And it reads. But the day of the Lord will come as, an un, as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And then the last one was Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 12. Yeah, 12. And it reads, I watched as a lamb broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a fig tree shaken by a strong wind. So all of this is Isaiah, um, again, talking to us about the day of the Lord. And I just want to bring all those scriptures together because they all go together. Oh man. And just, and they um, bring, um, they all reflect the same thing as being spoken of by Isaiah in this verse here. Now, verse five, and it says, when my sword is finished, it's work in the heavens. It will fall up on Edom, the nation I have marked for destruction. Hallelujah. So I wanted to read that one though from, let's see. We're going to talk about that for a little bit. Uh, Isaiah 35, 34, 34 verse 1. So I want to read that from the New King James. It says in um, verse 5, New King James Version, the same verse. It says, for my sword shall be gathered in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom. So let's talk about Edom. Who is it? Who is and what is Edom? So I'm going to read this from the Bible Dictionary. Amen. 
And in some of your Bibles, it may even say um, uh, idumia. Does anyone have idumia? Verse five, God's judgment on Edom. Does it, some may say idumia. So I'm going to give you the definition. We're going to read a little bit about who, who is idumia and who is Edom. Did anybody have Idumia in their text, in their Bible? Nobody? Okay, amen. Praise God. Okay. Now let's read about, I, I'm going to give the definition of who Idumia is. Um, Idumia, nation destined for judgment of Isaiah 34, 5, using the Septuagint and by Josephus for Edom. Idumia is Edom. Ed, Idumia, Edom is Esau. Okay, the region southeast of the Dead Sea, the Herods came originally from Idumea, Idumea or Idumea. King Herod was an Edomite. And, and this is in the scripture, but a lot of the, I don't know, we missed that. <laughs> we kind of like roll right over that, okay? He was an Edomite. And we all, we all know of this long conflict it's a forever conflict between um, Esau and who? I see your lips, but I don't hear you. Israel, the Hebrews. Yeah. Right. But the two brothers. Jacob. Amen. Esau and Jacob. Okay. Esau is Edom. So whenever you hear Idumia or Edom, we're talking Esau. Amen. Amen. And you're right. What Sister Eva said is correct. It's a constant conflict between Esau and Joseph or Israel, even up until this day. So now we read Idumia. Let's go to and read about a little bit, see what the uh, text has to say about Edom. Amen. Edom. It says Edom. Let me see. Wow. Check that up. Right here, it says, the land of Seir um, is synonymous with Edom. In um, some passages, of course, in Genesis uh, 33, 3, 36, 8, Judges 5 and 4. Teman also is used in opposition to Edom in at least one biblical passage. I'm going to skip down here. It says, the Israelites regarded the Edomites as close relatives. They are descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. It says enmity between Israel and Edom began with Jacob and Esau when the former stole the latter's birthright. I don't know why they say stole. He gave it to him. And anyway, and was formed and, um, and was exacerbated at the time of the Israelite exodus from Egypt when the Edomites refused the Israelites passage through their land. Much of the conflict came from Edom being a constant threat to Ju Judah's frontier and blocking Judean access to the, uh, the Gulf of Aquaba. Both Saul and David conducted warfare with the Edomites. David secured control of the Edomite area west of uh, Ar Arabah, as well as access to the Gulf of Aquaba. Later, Hadad of the royal Edomite line returned from Egypt and became an active adversary to Solomon. Conflict continuing changes in control of Edom um, that lasted through the monarchy. Eventually, the Edomites fell under the shadow of the major Eastern empires, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and, and the Greeks. But I want to stop right there because when we read further in the scripture, we'll see what God used those very nations to come against Edom and break it and, and destroy it, it's destroy Idumia. But they never were utterly destroyed. In fact, um, within the text, we read those that uh, may be in some of your Bibles, but those that have, may be removed, it said they've been blended into other nations. Okay, they've been blended into other nations and primarily uh, it was Rome. Rome was one of the major ones, okay? 
So let's go here because this just this this section talks a lot about Idumia. Do anybody want to um, say anything here? Because to me, was really what one of the most outstanding things is a lot of people do not realize that Herod what a uh, Herod was a Edomite. Okay. Anybody want to comment or have anything to say about that? Go ahead, uh, Elder Barnes, Sister Pat. Well, you know, when I read and when you read in the Bible about Edom, and then you read about the, the Lord's talking about them all the way over in the in the, in the small part, Obadiah and all them how He's gonna judge Edom. I mean, Edom. They watched their brothers being carried away. They didn't care about uh, Jacob. I mean, but you know, they fought in the womb. Yes. Even in the womb, they fought. Now, and it's supposed to go down the way it went down. It just went right down wrong because she shouldn't have got involved. The Lord had a plan. Right, right. Uh, but the Lord always had a plan. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He always got a plan. And always it wasn't like, excuse me, it wasn't like that took him by surprise. Uh-uh. God already knew. He already knew. Amen. So, okay, praise God. That was good. They battled from the womb and still is, people don't realize this is still a relevant to this very day. Amen. So let's go into um, verse five. And it says, and when my sword has finished its work in the heavens, it will fall on Edom and the nation I've marked for destruction. They are marked for destruction. And it says in verse six, it passed up for five. Okay, praise God. I want to read Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49. Let's see what, let's see what Jeremiah 49. Before I what a ladies. Jeremiah 49, 7. 49, 7. Start at verse 7. And it reads, this message was given concerning Edom. And this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Is there no wisdom in Teman? Is no one left to give wise counsel? Turn and flee, hide in deep caves, you people of Dedan. Now, these are places of Edom, okay? For when I bring disaster on Edom, I will punish you too. And those who harvest grapes always leave a few for the poor. If these came at night, they would not take everything, but I will strip bare the land of Edom and there will be no place left to hide. Amen. And um, Malachi, I think was another one. Malachi. I think it was Malachi. I think it was, yeah, Malachi. Malachi 1, verse 4. It says, Esau's descendants in Edom may say, We've been shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. But the Lord of heaven's armies replies, They may try to rebuild, but I will demolish them again. Their country will be known as the land of wickedness and their people will be called the people with whom the Lord is forever angry. Forever angry. It says, when you see the destruction for yourselves, you will say, truly, the Lord's greatness reaches far beyond Israel's borders. He said he has a forever issue with Esau. Oh, and Edom, Edomites. Amen. So uh, let's go back to um, Isaiah and pick up at verse six. Oh, no, I'm in 35. Lord Jesus. Yes, six. Okay, verse six. And it says, the sword of the Lord is drenched with blood and covered with fat with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of rams prepared for sacrifice. Yes, the Lord will offer a sacrifice in the city of Basra, and he will make a mighty slaughter in Edom. Let's 
Even men as strong as wild oxen will die. The young men alongside the veterans, the land will be soaked with blood and the soil enriched with fat. Mm. For it is the day of the Lord's revenge, the year when Edom will be paid back for all it did to Israel. The streams of Edom will be filled with burning pitch and the ground will be covered with fire. The judgment on Edom will never end. It will never end. See, and look, I can't go deep in this as I would like to go deep into this, but there is a perpetual, this still stands today. And there is a perpetual hate against God's people by these people. Esau, Edom. Amen. It's a perpetual hate. But God also has an anger that will never end towards them. And he's already said, why is he going to judge them? Because of what? Why is he judging them? We just read it. For what they did to Israel. Amen. 10, it says the judgment on Edom will never end and the smoke of its burning will rise forever. The land will lie deserted from generation to generation and no one will live there anymore. And no one does. I don't know if you've all ever seen, I think National Geographic or one of them uh, did um, uh, uh, a, 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 a special on this and they talked about uh, Petra and is deserted to this day. And you know how it talks in the scriptures where it says he builds his, uh, his, his home like is in the heights, in the mountains. And that's exactly where it is. And you know what? The stone is red. Even the very stone is red. <laughs> that is so funny. Amen. And it says in verse, um, continuing uh, verse 10, it said the land would lie deserted from generation to generation and no one will live there anymore. And it will be haunted by the desert isle and the screech isle. And that's what was there right now. The great isle and the raven for God will measure that land carefully. And he will measure it for chaos and destruction. It will be called the land of nothing. And all its nobles will soon be gone. Thorns will overrun it in palaces. You know what? I, I, I kind of, and I won't stop here for a minute at verse 13. I was wondering like, why did they name this, this um, chapter, a message for the nations. And then it dawned on me, thank you, Father God, by his spirit, because Esau is blended into the nations. Because if you read about it, this is primarily nothing but about Esau almost. It's almost it's primarily Esau who is being discussed here in this chapter. But he's not in all the nations like Israel has been scattered to every nation, but he has... These very nations, oh gosh, I, I can't, I want to go deeper, but he's blended into other nations, amen, and primary those nations that take issue with the most high people even to this day. Sister Eva. I just wanted to say, you kind of hit it on the head, and I, I was reading something else, is that what uh, has happened is that his seed, he put his seed into other nations. Yes, his descendants, yes. Yes. And there are primary still those nations that take issue with the well, most of primarily all of God's people, generally those that went into captivity are still even in those nations just today that are being ruled by these very people. Okay. Amen. Verse 13. It says, thorns will overrun its palaces, nettles and thistles will grow in its forts. The ruins will become a haunt for jackals and a home for owls. 
Amen. It says in verse 14, desert animals will mingle there with hyenas, their howls fill in the night while goats will bleed at one another among the ruins and, and night creatures will come there to rest. In verse 15, there the owl will make her nest and lay her eggs and she will hatch her young and cover them with her wings and the buzzards will come, each one with his mate. <laughs> I'm sorry, Elder Barnes, Sister Pat. <laughs> That's so funny. I was reading that. But anyway, when you talked about them dwelling in the cleft of the rock, it reminded me, I immediately thought it's in Obadiah. Obadiah talks about that. The first chapter of Obadiah around the yes. cleft, they were, they were prideful. They say they'll make their nest. And he said, you who dwell in the cleft of the rock. And they said, you can't bring me down. But the Lord said, well, I'm going to bring you down. Their haughtiness. <laughs> their yes. Haughtiness. Yeah. Eat them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Their haughtiness. They were a haughty people. Yes, even even to this day, even to this day, okay, is God said there's a perpetual. He got a perpetual hate for for uh, Esau, Edom. A perpetual hate. It never. It, it will never end. He said forever, forever. Amen. Forever. See now, you know what? We be like God. Love everybody. We just read right here. God said he got a perpetual hate. We just need to really get in, make sure we know what the words say. And it's not just as a concern, this, but about everything. Everything. Go ahead. Okay, I'll be quiet after this. But you know what? When you said a perpetual hate, they are unrepentant. They will not repent. I know that sounds, somebody said, well, you judging them. Mm -mm. There's an arrogance of, just like he said, just like they said in Obadiah, you know, they'll say, you know what? We can do this. We can do that. They will not repent. Mm -hmm. Amen. Unrepentant. And that's, and that's why you said, he said, you were talking about loving everybody. Well, we know that's not true after we saw that. <laughs> okay. That's hard for us to believe about this sweet little Jesus that we talk about. Yeah. But he has the wrath. And, and there's going to be a day of judgment for the wickedness that's been done. Amen. 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 Pastor Dave. Oh, I said Pat really kind of took that because I, it goes back to the scripture. God said he will love those that love him and even go with their protection and hate those who hate him. So even though the Edomites, you know, against Israel, it started, but they're hating and rejecting God. And they hate God's people because they're faithful or they put they trust. We just read that uh, chapter to go in this chapter because we put our faith in God. So it's not a direct, even though it's direct, it's indirect to us because we're trusting in God. They're really hate. They're they're turning their backs and they're rejecting God and their pride and their arrogance. And they do not, as she said, they do not want to repent and understand that God is their king. Going back to the chapter before, that God is their king and, and that He is their resource so they have pride and areas in their self they're boasting and god said well you, you hate me you reject me i'm going to reject you now that also as if you're trusting in god you're going to add that in there you're going to you, you reign with christ you're going to suffer with him so even though it's directly seemed like it's against us it is but it's kind of indirect because they're really against god and we just happen to be in his kingdom so we have to be added to that that hate Amen. And it all, it started with Esau. Yes. It, uh, but we still have to remember, you're absolutely right. And even with us today, because we are all the most highest people and all those that are grafted in, but we must, this is a direct um, um, conflict still to this day between these same people. These same people still exist in the earth. Amen. And so is this, this is a perpetual hate for what has been done. Now, and you're absolutely right what you said. You're absolutely right. They hate God's people. And in God's people, period. Uh, those grafted in and those are not. Praise God. So this is a perpetual hate, an per, uh, um, a ongoing conflict that will never end. And the, big, and the biggest, and the most high says it directly in his scripture He's going to deal with them for what they did. 
for what they did. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So we left Sister off. Sylvia, and, Sister Sylvia, yeah. I, I just wanted to add something just to add on to what Sister uh, Pat was just saying is that uh, there are some, yeah, they hate, they hate the most highest people, but also we have to understand that there are some that will cleave and there are some, the, the word of God says, I think it's in Jeremiah 16, he was said that um, uh, our father have lied to us. And so that means that there were some that wanted to repent, but because of the pride and because of the arrogance, they said that their heart had began to get hardened toward the most high and toward his people in that order. So those are the things that he hates, which is pride. He said, I resist it. So we have to also understand that in any kind of hatred, if you hate Yah, you, you, you hate his people, then, you know, he hates you. Amen. He hates he hate evil. He, he has to. He's just that holy. And I know we, oh, God love all people. Get a revelation of what the Most High is saying about them. He do love them. Don't get us wrong. But he said that he would have forgiven them if they would have repented the yeah. same way he gonna, we have to do every day. Repent. Absolutely. Absolutely. We all must come in at the door. <laughs> Amen. It don't matter who it is. Amen. Now it says in verse 16, it says, search the book of the Lord and see what he will do. Not one of these birds and animals will be missing and none will lack a mate. For the Lord has promised this. So the most high is saying exact, the, he said, search his word. He said, because exactly what he said, he will do. If he said it's going to be a buzzard and the buzzard's mate, he said, that's exactly what's going to be there. I, I, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to be funny, but he said, look what my word, what does it say? He said, this it, it, it is going to fulfill exactly what I said. It's not going to miss a beat. And this is me paraphrasing. This is just what he's saying here. And, you know, the Most High took issue with Esau way back when he, um, you know, took no uh, concern for his birthright. So, you know, even though God won, even with his descendants, even though God was continuing to bless them because, you know, first him and Joseph made up. Remember when Joseph left and then came back, they, they, they made up. But then the, their, all of their descendants start going at each other. And then, you know, then they would get along. But there was this, oh gosh, I didn't get this story. I got to look where the scripture is, where they were, the, the, uh, Israel, Judah were going into captivity. And uh, Esau, Esau descended, blocked them and even captured some and turned them over. And because of this, because they despise their brother, they are being judged. And this is a word for now. Because they despise their brother. So the Most High said, because of that, I have a perpetual hate that will never end. And for what they did, and also like what um, Sister Pat mentioned, the whole chapter of Obadiah, I think that for whole first one is all about uh, his judgment He's that's going to be brought uh, on um, Esau, on Edom. Even old King Herod, like I said, we didn't even realize he was an Edomite, but the scriptures clearly tell us he was. He was. Amen. He was given authority by the Romans to sit in the position he was in. Because he, he wasn't an Israelite. Remember now who he was and what position he held. Okay. Amen. So we completed 34 and Isaiah's uh, 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 his judgment as spoken to him by the Most High as given to him 
about Esau Edom. And he's one of he's one of the first prophets that is is bringing us this word as it concerns Esau or Edom, that judgment that's going to be brought on them. So let's go to the questions for chapter 34. It's not many, it's only a couple. And then we're going to go into 35. But before we even do that, I just want to talk about, you know what, when we, like I said, this is a word that speaks to us even yet now, because God is really, and, and we've talked about this before, God really does um, care about how we treat one another. And he's not, you know, so much so that it's in one of the, it's one of the commandments. So, and, you know, and we look at this and we, I mean, but we really need to really think about this. We really do despise our brothers and sisters sometimes. I ain't gonna lie. Because look, even the biological ones, sometimes they might be the ones we be despising the most. <laughs> but God, he doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. We are our brother's keeper. And this is very, very important to the most high how we treat one another and how we love one another how we take care of one another because we and i often reflect back to even the israelites we got to remember they were in a community that was solely them and just is just them so how they treated one another that it was very very important to god because I mean, that was one, a very um, serious matter to him. And I think we read er in the beginning, I think it was when, uh, gosh, what was that we read earlier when we first started out reading Isaiah? I think it was in Chronicles. And the Benjamin, they went down there and at the, they uh, dealt with Benjamin. The, who was that? Was that me? Was that a pastor? Ed taught that. It was one, I can't remember. We talked about, uh, remember, they went down and they uh, dealt with the Benjamites. Yes, and boy, they were slaughtered. Yeah, the Benjamites, the, the Benjamites were wrong, but they were they and and Israel went down there and they were slaughtering them. No, Benjamites were slaughtering them, and because they decided what they were. Did Pastor Ed teach that? Was that him? Yeah, yeah. Pastor Ed, could you speak on that? That was in Judges. Okay, yeah. When they had a. Uh... Killed, it was actually no, the Benjamites had killed the Levites' concubine. Yes. And he took the body, chopped it up, and sent it to all the other tribes to bring them against the Benjamites. And they virtually almost wiped all the Benjamites out. Because remember, they had to give them the women from the other tribes for them to replenish yeah. themselves. So, so yeah, God is. is always you know i'm trying to find i don't want to dominate but he's always in well let me back up because i listen to this one thing we, we don't want to be guilty of thinking that the edom is one set of people yeah they're not the blue people they're not the purple people or the orange or the, no right. edom is a people group that they play a certain display a certain spirit yes so, so it's really not the color of their skin or their That's culture. Right. It is their spirit that sets them at odds against God. Yes. Because it was very interesting with what, uh, but try to be quick, what Jesus told Nicodemus. He said, the key to see the kingdom of uh, heaven or the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. So really, anybody that really and truly experienced that new birth, they have a new identity. We will look the same, but spiritually we're not the same. Amen. And the only way we can uh, verify that or substantiate that is how we treat each other. It, it really, to me, that's what manifests. For me personally, that's the only way you can judge. I'm not saying I can judge who's saved and who's not. 
But once we've experienced that new birth, uh, you got the Holy Spirit in you that's going to compel you to do certain things to similar people, to godly people. You will recognize God and you will try. See, we are to be a representation of God to each other. Yes. We don't. I can't think I'm better than you and think that I'm serving God. Mm -hmm. I can sit in church forever and a day and it doesn't help. It's all on how the character of God flows from us to others. That's what God, because what God said, this is why you're going to suffer. This is why I will always hate you by how you treat my children. Mm -hmm. See, he's talking about the nations. Nation. And when you hear yeah. nations, you're not talking about a country. He's yeah. talking about people. Yes. People. See, we, we got to remember that. He's talking about people. I don't care if they're even in Africa. He's talking about people. Yes. And how you treat God's people is going to either bless you, allow you to be blessed, or it's going to put you in a position to be cursed. Amen. And it's a shame that in America, so many people sitting up in church and they are cursed. God has a fervent, now they may look successful on the outside, but spiritually, mm -hmm. they're going to get toasted. They're going to get nuked, as we said in the army. In the final day, because God said, and in the end, you didn't read 17, he said, he surveyed and divided the land and deeded it over to those creatures. They will possess it from generation. He's going to give you all this land you think it, I'm giving it to, to wild animals. So he's deeded over. I'm giving them the right to be there and you don't have it. So in other words, he's going to replace this Edomite spirit with animals. <laughs> and they're going to have the legal right to be there and human beings are not <laughs> because of the way they treated God's people. I don't think that could be overemphasized. It can't be overpreached. We can't overthink that because that is the only thing that's going to be able to manifest. The only ident com common bond we're going to have is how we treat each other in accordance to the way God tells us. Anybody that can't treat anybody well or treat anybody as at least an equal to some degree, you can't have the uh, Holy Spirit. You're not listening to him. If you haven't, you're, not, you're paying him no attention. Absolutely. But it's important because God is very serious about how his children, how we are treated. Amen. That's how I get out of this chapter. He is extremely serious about that. Yes. He doesn't give second chances. <laughs> Amen. 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 Well said. And how we treat one another. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Thanks, Pastor Ed. So the first question for chapter 34 is, how is the sovereignty of God depicted? And we'll find this in verses one through four. How is the sovereignty of God depicted? I know it seems kind of a book. Anybody? It's an indignation. He got to be destructive. Yes. Uh, and judgmental, we're gonna judge. Judge the nation. Nations, yes. Man, that's absolutely <laughs> right. That's absolutely right. Praise God. And the second question was, what nation is particularly marked for judgment? Uh, Sister Pat, the chapter was Edom, wasn't it? Yes, judgment, Edom. Yes, Edom. Edom. Amen. Amen. So those were the only two questions I had for that chapter. Because like I said, it, I was kind of perplexed for a while. I was like, why is this titled the nations are going to be judged when the only ones being talked about here really is Esau, Edom. And then I, they're, they're blended in nations. And primarily when they were conquered by Rome, many of them were actually blended into the Roman Empire. Okay. Amen. All right. So, Sylvia. Yes. One thing, this always reminds me of um, what, when I always think about that he's, that the Lord is timeless. Mm. He doesn't, he doesn't live in time. He created time for us. And so when you read this and it's in Isaiah, but you know, the Bible says one day to him is a thousand years. My goodness. Yes. Judgment has no end. He has no, he can do what he wants. He is sovereign. You know, and I you, I think about that sometimes. We say, "Oh, what, this been a long. This was a long time ago." But he doesn't live in time. We live in time. He created time for us. 
Yeah, and then, it's for us to give us balance, but he doesn't need time. So when he's, when something's, people say that happened, well, that only happened, that happened a thousand years ago, 600 years ago, 200 years ago, a hundred years ago. He said, I hadn't forgotten it. I hadn't forgotten it. I still want to judge things because and judgment comes because there is no repentance. Absolutely. And the short fact, no no repentance. repentance. Go ahead, Pat. I, I, what was that in part? Oh, I said judgment comes. I mean, things are still going to be judged, but judgment comes due in large to no repentance. Amen. Amen. And they had none. Because like you said, when you read in Obadiah, they were very prideful. Like you can bring us down, but we're going to build it right back up. You know, they were very prideful people. Amen. And the Most High said, "There's a, he, his hate is for them is forever. Now, that, that's strong right there. I mean, like he said, forever. Okay. Amen. So let's go ahead and go into chapter 35. We're going to start. Wow. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So... Chapter 35, and starting at verse one. And um, it read, now my, my Bible titled this chapter, a serious, I mean, um, hope for restoration. But I, I thought that was, yeah, I went and got one of my other Bibles and kind of was going through with the other Bibles and looking for what they called the chapter, how they named it. And it said, called it the joy of the redeemed. And to me, that was the best title for this chapter. The joy of the redeemed. Amen. So let's begin. 35.1. It reads. It says, even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. And I want to go back to, uh, I want to go forward to Isaiah 55 real quick and 55, 12. And it reads, it says, you will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. And this is to the redeemed of God. Okay, amen. And it says in verse two in Isaiah, it says, yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. It says the desert will become as green as the mountain of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. And I want to read uh, Isaiah 25, because let's go back here and see what that says. Isaiah 25, 9, because it spoke to this. And it says, in that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings, because this is to the redeemed of God. This is who is being spoken to right now in this chapter, okay? Amen. And then in verse um, three, it says, with this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees, praise God. Okay, so we're to encourage these people, those of, um, who are in this condition or in this state and just one another with this encouraging word, you know, for the redeemed, this is a word to those who are in Christ, who've been redeemed by the Lord. This is a hallelujah word right here. Amen. Amen. And it reads um, in verse um, four, it says, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He's coming to save you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. 
Verse five, and when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Let's stop right there. And we're going to, let's see, John, let's go to John nine. John chapter nine, uh, verse six, John nine, six, and it reads, then he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So listen, this is all, this is talking about our Messiah, our savior. OK, because see, salvation, uh, these same promises, it was like, OK, Jesus is everything is in Christ. There's nothing outside of him. And then yet a promise for even future glory. A future promise. Amen. When we read this chapter. OK, verse. Six. And it says the lame will leap like deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth, forth in the wilderness and the streams will water the wasteland. So, you know, to me, this was like when Jesus came in all these different things, the, the healing and, the, and, and um, the, all the things he was doing, all the miracles he performed, it, it, it was like saying, he was doing that then, but it was also, this is what is going to be for all those who come even later at the, in the end that are in Christ. This is the promise of a, a future glory. Amen. Let's see, verse six. Let's see. Um, let's go to Luke. Well, you can um, just write it down. Luke 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. And I'm going to read it through. Yeah, 21. 7, 19 through 21. And it reads. The disciples of John, no, I'm sorry, that's 1919. Okay, and he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we be looking for someone else? And John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, and then we talk about this. We talked about this earlier. They all, Israel always knew they were told this from the, they knew that, but when Messiah came, they did not recognize him. It's plain in the word. There's no excuse. Though there was those that they look what they said. Are you the one that we were told of? They knew. They had been hearing and it had been passed on from generation to generation. These words, this the oh, Isaiah, this look, these are the old texts. They were passed on to them. They knew they had been hearing about the Messiah, but yet when he came, what did Jesus say? He said it, it broke his heart. He said, because they did not recognize the day of their salvation. Glory to God. Um, let me see. Luke, also, I want to read oh, watch. Luke 11. Luke 11, 14.
And it says, one day Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak. And when the demon was gone, the man began to speak and the crowds were amazed. Amen. But these are just some of the things that were being mentioned here in Isaiah that will be done. Even during the time of Jesus' arrival on the scene, okay, when he actually began to minister, and even yet a later promise, a later promise, amen, to all those who are in Christ and what he's going to do when he returns. And in, in the end times, Sister Eve, I saw your, you didn't, I saw your finger, but I didn't see your, okay. Okay. You see my hand now? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say when you said that, you know, when uh, that in Luke, what you just spoke of is that, um, and it's still a promise even to this day. He said, yes. you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You shall cast out demons. You know, and all of this to go go on and go on and go on to this day. This is what we should do and can do, but only by him, by his spirit, by his power, by his authority. That's what he said. He's anointed us to do. He said, greater work shall we do. And we don't have to look for them because they're going to follow you. Why? Because we believe that it is him that do it through us. Just the vessels, we're just the messengers. It is he that it does it through us. And I just wanted to say that. that was, those are the greater works, he said, shall we do. He we do. will speak, yeah. you know. Even the dead will rise. Those who are dead in, in the Messiah, they arise. Amen. And it's reads in, um, uh, let's finish up six. It says, springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wastelands. In Isaiah 35, uh, verse 7. Let's read, yeah, in, in thir uh, 35, 7. And it says, the parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and the rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. Now see, here is a promise for when he returns at the end. See, even right, let me see, I, I'm trying to convey this. All those in Christ, we are blessed in Christ even yet now, but even yet he said at the end, he's explaining even greater things that are going to be done in the end when he returns. Amen. So here we see what God, he already shown what he was going to do when he was arrived, just being in Christ. When he got here, what he would do. Like I said, there is no excuse for when they, he came and he began to perform the miracles because right here in 35, what we're reading, it said he would do these things when he came. But yet even he's talking about something that's going to be done in the end when he returns. Amen. Um, let's, I want to read Acts. Does anybody um, want to say anything or just anything? No, no, nobody want to comment or I had to move around. I want to make sure I miss no hands. Amen. Let's go to uh, Acts. Let's see. Acts three. Acts chapter three. Three seven, three seven, and and then it says, then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up, and as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk. It says, then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. Amen. So we hear what Sister Eva was talking about, where even how the, the God's word, the promises of God of us walking in the power and authority of Christ, moving even through Peter, those who um, are in Christ. So why are these things not happening? I mean, why? Why are we not seeing signs? Why are we not? I want somebody to talk about this. Nobody want to address this. 
because you know what we can see we see in other countries i see it in like primarily like africa you see it and even a lot of us when we went to on a, to, to a, a lot of these countries um haiti saw some of these things these things actually occur so why is we, sister pat i think because we don't believe okay so um we love y'all but we don't believe you know, we don't lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Faith to believe that, you know what? I mean, you think about the centurion. He said, you don't even have to call. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. That kind of faith to believe that if I lay hands on somebody, Pat Barnes, if you lay hands on somebody to believe and have a faith that it's going to happen. You may not see it in that moment, but it's going to happen. I mean, I think we don't have the faith. I think we don't believe. And we stop. We Also, we don't, we, the practice of laying on of hands is, is is we don't do it you know absolutely now here's I, I i agree with you sister pat but here's another thing now and here's one that actually is not it says if you are sick you call upon the elders and the elders will come and pray for you and what it says you'll be not only will you be healed but your sins will be forgiven so i mean these are things that we're supposed to be doing so i mean it i, I believe it is a faith thing I do believe this. I've even heard some people say that's not for now. So is it for now? Is it not for now? I mean, I'm just like, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm on going by what the Bible say. Because to me, that's the only thing that applies as far as I'm concerned. What do the words say? So why are we not seeing healing? Why, are, you know, listen here, I'm going to share something with y'all. And I said this to somebody, and this is, look, it's a whole bunch of people need deliverance. I'm. It, it, I, I thought, you know, look, we was really seeing some stuff before, like when we was at Cliffdale and we were going to the encounters and things like that and people's getting delivered. We've seen it. I've seen it. We've seen it in our own houses when we were doing cell group. We were doing these very things. What, I mean, but so like what, what happened? What 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 happened though for real? Cause I'm telling y'all, it's a lot of people now. They done seen the witchcraft was a trick. They done seen the tarot cards not working. Reading the zodiac is not getting it. But see, all this stuff they've been dabbling in witchcraft and all of this different stuff. It's some stuff right now. These people need to live from, and it's on a whole nother level. Uh. I had to stand back and ask my, cause see, I know what it entails. See, I think that's what the real issue is because these things can only be cast out by fasting and prayer. And we ain't walking that kind of walk right now. We ain't trying to be like, I, I look, I ain't trying to be pushing my plate away. I'm not really trying to be pressing in getting before God like, Cause it take that, that is a lifestyle kind of thing. Cause we ain't just walking up, laying hands on trying to deliver people because that's what it's going to take. Cause it's some, I'm telling you, I'm seeing the stuff that's out here. And I know you all are too. Pastor Ed. Yeah, so sir, I'll try to be brief and that, there's no one issue that I see. I will agree that it, it should still be going on and to smaller degrees, it actually is. But I think the problem in America, because I've been other places and you're right, you see it. The problem in America is the church, and mm -hmm. I, I use that term very loosely, and what some people refer to themselves as Christians have become come so convoluted and have added so much worldly principles into their doctrine that the church, the church as a whole, even yeah. people that may be saved, has relinquished a great deal of its spiritual power to Satan hey. without realizing it. And hey. when true believers come up and say, sir, because right now I say things you would say, some people think you're radical and out of your head. Yes. But it's been time, sometimes I've seen, I know we've done, we've seen things. We've seen, and I don't want to prolong your about it, but we saw at a time in our house, a lady came in there and she probably had demons. She fell as soon as she crossed the threshold, started foaming at the mouth. And I'm not bragging. It happened. I was there. Yes. Y'all know yes. about it. There's been other things, and I know the other people have experienced that. And 
I wish I knew why, because I would say we need to bring it back. The only thing I say is that the, the churches, the believers that relinquish power to Satan. We're too busy trying to emulate stuff we see. If it's up to me, I'm going to stop on this because I'll get crazy. If it's up to me, all this televangelist stuff will cease. All these podcasts, all these radio shows, all these TV shows, all these little fake pimping preachers will vanish. Amen. Amen. Okay, they're, they're making it hard on those of us that really believe. Yes. That's the problem is. It's so, so much pollution. People don't know what's real and what's not. And they don't trust what's That's real. True. That's like the counterfeit looks so much like what's real now that people can people that need it cannot tell it apart and they're not going to trust. Amen, amen. And and I honestly, that word you passed the day that you brought back to the basics, to me that's as basic. That is part of the basic. That is part of the basic. Delivering people. You know, I mean, we're not delivering them, but, you know, we're praying, you know, just, just helping people and teaching people that 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 just teaching the base, the basic principle of, of, God, of the gospel. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. And then getting them delivered. And then teaching them the word and teach them how to study for themselves and go to God for themselves. Not come to us, not go to no man. You go to God for yourself. Amen. Sister Eva. Oh, I, I'm know, I, know. Oh. I see his hand. No, I just throwing that word in and the Holy Spirit has brought to me that exactly what Pastor Ed said. But the problem is, I think one of the problems is multifactorial, but the church has become institutionalized. That's the word I'm gonna use. And in doing that, we have locked ourselves up. And understand that God moved through individuals, not a group of people coming together. Because I mean, even sometimes I'm in clinic. I prayed for a little girl the other day, and I'm telling you, I saw a miracle. But it's like the Holy Spirit said, no, you pray for this girl. You know, I didn't ask what they say, one saved now. I also got moved by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't me going, so, oh, I see a problem. Let me just run up and pray. No, the Holy Spirit said, hey, this opportunity, here you go. Because Jesus went about doing what his father commanded him to do so we have he was guided by the holy spirit and we're now we're guided by a man guided by a pastor or the evangelist telling us to do stuff the holy spirit is in control it's his church it's his power Amen. so we have in institutionalized ourselves and i think now we're breaking free from that in institutionalization we're going to see that we're going to see that we're going to see that individual we're going to see i really do believe in my heart we're going to see that we're not going to be on tv trying to have some healing ceremony and all this kind of crap, but individual and in, in the spiritual life and pastor prayer, these are, we're going to see signs and wonders. They're going to follow us, but we can't do that while we in, institutionalized. We have to have those prison doors that we've locked out. So they have to be broken individually. Amen. Amen. Because each one of us is the church. <laughs> each one of us is the church. You're right. It's not the institution. It's each individual believer that's walking in Christ, walking in the power and authority of the most high, high God. Amen. Amen. Gosh, I didn't realize you guys, it was so late. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me put a, cause put a mark here so I can remember why I left off verse eight and we'll pick up here. Next week, if it be God's will, we stopped in 35.8. And please, you guys, if you get the opportunity, go ahead through to 36. I read ahead. That's why a lot of times I forget where I stopped. And I try to mark, but then everything is end up marked up. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, hey, and we'll we'll do the questions next week as well. Amen. I think we did. We'll get to those questions. Praise God. So we'll, let's go ahead, you guys, and we're going to go ahead and pray. Amen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you for your word, oh God. Thank you, Father God, for loving us and keeping us and taking care of us. Thank you, Father God, for being the lifter of our head. Thank you, Almighty God, for being our rear and our front guard. We can do nothing without you, Almighty God. And we thank you, Father God, 
Thank you for keeping us, keeping our families, oh God. In the name of Jesus, Father God, we ask, Father God, that you would continue to encamp your angels round about us tonight, oh God. Round about our families, oh God, to all those that are listening tonight, all those, Father God, who are um, in K uh, members of KCM, Father God, we ask, Father God, that you will continue to encamp your angels round about us, our families, oh God, to keep us lifting us up, Father God, protecting us, least we should even dash our feet against a stone, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray and ask that you would encamp your angels round our homes, our properties, and, and all those we pray for, and don't allow any unclean man, beast, or spirit, oh God, we pray, to come on our properties or into our homes in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray, Father God, that we bring glory to your name. We pray that our lights will shine, oh God. Father God, that others will desire to taste and see that you are the only good God. Father God, you are God all by yourself. Thank you, Father God. We love you, oh God. We thank you for your word. We ask that you, Father God, continue to lead us and guide us on the path of righteousness for your name's sake, oh God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.